to be a video response to Ritchie 3622. Ritchie's main argument, while having two or three peripheral points, was summed up at 339, where Ritchie says, As such, your ticket into atheism is not proving whether or not God exists, it is proving God isn't worth believing in. End quote. In other words, it's argued that there is some motivator that renders belief in God repulsive. My purpose in this paper, in a roundabout way, is to answer this main objection by answering the peripheral points he makes, and then moving to a conclusion. So let's get started. The first of Ritchie's peripheral points is that if we assume that intelligent design is true, then what follows from this point does not necessarily prove God exists. Rather, God is one of multiple options, for example, aliens, or a supervenient conscious mind. I agree with this point. However, I would think the proponents of intelligent di design would also agree. The defenders of ID from the Discovery Institute have said multiple times that they are not arguing for a specific designer, just for design. However, I personally believe the induction of a personal creator from design is tenable via philosophical argumentation. Let me briefly explain what I mean here. In natural theology, there is an argument called the Kalam cosmological argument. The argument goes like this, one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist, and therefore three, the universe has a cause. Now this cause comes into play here by what we can infer about the cause via scientific data and philosophical thought. Since the Big Bang is the point where all matter, space, and time entered into existence, this would imply that prior to the Big Bang there was no space, time, and matter. Makes sense. Thus it follows that the cause of the universe who was prior to the Big Bang cannot consist of any material and this cause must be timeless, beginningless, spaceless, and very, very powerful. But there is something else we can infer about this cause, that being that the cause is personal, implying agency. See the description. So from the assumed design, we can tentatively argue for God for the properties of the cause of the universe. Ritchie's second peripheral point is that he doubts the historicity of the Bible. He states that the fact that events were written in a historical time period does not suggest that all the characters within the biblical narrative are indeed actual historical persons. While I see no logical reason to disagree with Ritchie's on this point, he offers no real argument here, so at best, it is a question-begging assertion. While it is possible that Jesus is not an historical figure, it is also very possible that he is an historical figure, and there are multiple evidence to support this claim. For example, the spread of Christianity in hostile contexts, the conversion and spread of Paul's epistles, and the Roman and Jewish non-Christian writers. The third peripheral point is what do we mean by God? Ritchie suggests at a minute 18 that God is a being who has three attributes, namely omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence. He incorporates these attributes as a launch pad of sorts into his fourth peripheral point about free will, determinism, and final his main objection. I have several thoughts on this definition of God, but for the sake of time I'm going to leave them unaddressed here and place them in the description, so look at that. Fourth, Ritchie suggests that God is selfish and benevolent since he knows what people will choose and yet, quote, throws them into a chain of events that will lead them to hell, end quote. He starts this fourth point by suggesting that there is one event within everyone's life that they have no free will over, and that is when they're born, which calls into question free will. However, let me make a critical distinction here against his attack on free will. When we speak of a person with a will, this presupposes that this person exists, correct? In other words, you need to exist in order to have a will, or to exercise a will. However, the suggestion that you have no free will, quote, when you are conceived, end quote, seems meaningless, since you have no free will to exercise prior to the moment of conception, because you do not exist prior to the moment of conception. Thus, your conception is literally at the expense of the free will of your parents, and does not defeat free will. Ignoring that example, Ritchie summarizes his point at 2 minutes 13 seconds, quote, If God does not want me to end up into hell, then why throw me into a chain of events that will lead me into hell? Even though I will essentially make these choices out of free will, God is still creating me to burn in hell. And then he wants to blame me for it. And then he wants to blame you for it. Here I need to make two critical distinctions. First, Ritchie is arguing against compatibilism and not libertarian free will. By compatibilism, I mean the view that every human action is caused by events that obtained prior to some action and thus free will is compatible with determinism. Thus, Ritchie's definition of free will is slightly different than what we typically think free will is. 
Let me give an example. The free will decision to become an atheist by person A is caused by the events in A's life that happened prior to A's decision to become an atheist. Thus, free will in this case is defined differently than libertarian free will. According to libertarian free will, freedom is not compatible with determinism. So when an agent acts freely, he is the first mover of sorts. So using the same example, according to libertarianism, the free will decision to become an atheist by person A is caused by the inherent control exercised by person A to become an atheist. So person A chose to become an atheist because he had the inherent control to do so, and not because his will was being influenced by a causal chain of events. Second, Ritchie confuses necessity with contingency. Let me explain here. Ritchie is using a fatalistic argument. Specifically, he is arguing that in virtue of God's foreknowledge, everything is fated to occur necessarily. In other words, it would be impossible for the events that occur to occur in any other way. Now, this argument employs modal logic and the notions of necessary and possible truth. A, necessar a necessary truth is a truth that is impossible to be false. A possible truth is a contingent truth, or in other words, a truth that could be true or could be false. Thus, Ritchie's argument can be formed deductively. 1. Necessarily, if God foreknows Ritchie's atheism, then Ritchie will be an atheist. 2. God did in fact foreknow Ritchie's atheism. Conclusion. Therefore, necessarily, Ritchie is an atheist. However, the inference that Ritchie could not choose anything else other than atheism from premises 1 and 2 would confuse the necessity of the inference with the necessity of the consequent. In other words, what follows from premise 1 and 2 is not, that, not the necessity of Ritchie's atheism, but merely that Ritchie will be an atheist, because Ritchie's atheism, given God's foreknowledge, is contingent, but not necessary. Let me say this again in another way. Given his foreknowledge, God knows that Ritchie will contingently, but not necessarily, choose atheism. This implies that the choice could be different, i.e. the choice is not necessary. We can conclude, therefore, that the choice of atheism is a contingent truth and not a necessary truth, and thus Ritchie is not fated by omniscience. The only thing that would fade his choice would be if it were not possible for him to choose something else, which is simply not the case. This brings us full circle back to the main objection, quote, as such your ticket into atheism is not proving whether or not God exists, it's proving God isn't worth believing in, end quote. This statement was supported by the supposed disjointed nature of God's omniscience, forcing individuals into hell. As such, God was categorized as selfish and malevolent. However, this was demonstrated to not be the case for four reasons. First, people's choices are contingent events and not necessary events via God's omniscience. This means that the truth behind X will be an atheist is either true or false, but it is not a necessary truth, and thus the fatalistic argument does not work. Second, via libertarian free will and not the compatible notion of free will, People are not thrown into a chain of events that leads them to hell, and thus I believe Ritchie is attacking only one account of freedom out of many viable options. Third, according to monalism, God has knowledge of all people, all possible worlds rather, in which he could actualize the largest number of people who would be saved via their free will choices and has done so. Fourth, and finally, it makes no sense to me to suggest one has no other option than hell. The gospel was given and salvation through Jesus Christ was given and has been offered, and thus no one is really determined to hell. They all have the option to choose. Thus, in the light of several important distinctions and clarifications of God's omni attributes, I see no reason standing to think that God is not worth believing in. Moreover, such a conclusion seems to me irrational, meaning devoid of reason, given the salient facts presented. Let me explain here. Ritchie's main argument assumes that intelligent design is true, and more importantly, that it is more important to find some flaw in God's character than provide evidence against his existence. So, if the argument allows for God's existence, then void of the argument which religion is true, it is irrational to ignore or refuse a being that demands ethical perfection while acknowledging the implications of such an action, that being heaven or hell, and instead of taking action, resort to blame shifting. So while Ritchie may very well appeal to such an argument, this was not suggested inherently in his video, so I am left to deduce an incomplete logical conclusion of wishful autonomy. I do not mean to be rude here, but I would kindly suggest to refuse such logic. You simply can't tear down faith in less than five minutes. Instead, may I also kindly suggest that when one applies diligent personal study to these matters, the end result provides more than enough information to deflate skepticism. Peace.